Welcome back to the Thinking Crypto Podcast, your home for cryptocurrency news and interviews. With me today is Dan Kim, who is the VP of Business Development and Listings at Coinbase. Dan, it's great to have you on. Glad to be here. Excited to talk about crypto. Excited to talk about listings. Let me know when you're ready to start. Yeah, Dan, I'm excited to speak with you as well. Coinbase being the largest US crypto exchange, you guys are doing a lot of great things. And I got a lot of questions for you on the listings front and your partnerships. But let's start with your background. Where are you from? Where'd you grow up? Born in Korea, uh, spent about the first five years of my life there, and then uh, emigrated to the United States with my parents. Grew up mostly in California, LA. Uh, went to uh, school in the Bay Area, um, and then moved back to LA. Did a couple of stints in Dallas and New York, and now I'm back in the Bay Area. So yeah, it's uh, primarily a California kid. <laughs> and uh, what did you do before working at Coinbase? I started my career in finance, um, or structured finance and derivative, derivatives, um, and then um, really got into tech really quickly. Um, just kind of started to see a lot of the tech boom back in the early 2000s. So I uh, worked for software companies, um, worked for hardware companies and optical uh, networking. Took a little bit of a break, uh, decided to move away from tech and get closer to consumers. So open up a frozen yogurt and smoothie chain um, uh, called Red Mango. Did that for about seven, eight years um, and then got back into tech um, and first into automotive, um, working at uh, Tesla, which was really cool. And then um, um, that led me to a Coinbase doing crypto. Wow. Uh, interesting journey going from Red Mango to Tesla and then to Coinbase. Yeah, no, it's uh, a good way to confuse people when they were, whenever they ask me, hey, tell me a little bit about your background. I always tell them it's not going to make sense, but just hear me out. Well, you know, it's it's the great thing about it is I, I kind of industry hopped in my early days as well. Um, and it gave me a, a great perspective on business and understanding uh, different facets of business as well. So I'm sure it was a great experience. Yeah, you know, I've, um, except for my first job in, in in banking and finance, every company I've worked for has been led by a founder. And, you know, if you kind of look back at my career, I think one of the themes that starts to emerge is I love building, I love operating, I love creating, I love connecting with customers. And I like just, you know, doing everything across business, not just one thing. So that's helped a lot in terms of just at least explaining why I've done so many different things in my career. But the common theme is always about doing something that's new, interesting, innovative, and things that are going to just change the ways we live and make that better. So I'm really into just helping people access a better quality of life um, using technology. And that's kind of been my theme since um, I discovered tech, um, you know, 20 years ago. So when did you first come across crypto and what was your aha moment? When did it click for you? I've always been fascinated with crypto as a financial instrument or a, or a um, you know, just in terms of, you know, you know people being able to just buy, sell, trade, um, and thought it was a fascinating um, alternative to, uh, you know, the way, way money works in this world. Um, and it was, you know, there's a lot of kind of technical literature you can read, a lot of white papers you can read, and I was definitely fascinated by that. Didn't really have that aha moment in terms of like how it can apply to real life or everyday life beyond um, just financial systems until I um, discovered this game accidentally called Ro Roblox. Uh, uh, and my daughter um, was spending so much time and my money on it. And um, I started to just kind of look at it. I was like, what exactly is going on with Roblox? Obviously not a Web3 game, but if you kind of take a look at how it's built and the way they've designed some of these games with limited edition items, the ability to kind of buy things and like track its value over time, um, ability to trade things. And, you know, just looking at that, plus how many hours my daughter, she's 14 now, and her friends spent in the screen just living life. Um, that gave me the aha moment. I was like, wait a minute. If Roblox is creating its own little ecosystem with fake money, imagine what you can do with real money um, and imagine what the power of NFTs can do as an example. So Roblox ironically was kind of the moment in time where I said, wait a minute, gaming could be what really launches Web3 and crypto into everyday life. Yeah, and on that note, um, certainly a lot of digitization happening 
I often talk about the token economy and and everything running on the blockchain. And to your point of these different games and different ecosystems, maybe having your own NFTs, own tokens on different blockchains and an interoperability between all these different tokens. Uh, you know, it's it's kind of crazy when you think about it and what will be, you know, come to fruition. Um, and we're still early, but yeah, I mean, I, I, do you have any thoughts on on that token economy and and, you know, what that might look like for your kids, you know, as they get older? You know, it's a good question, and I think it's a question that has um, is going to be answered in many different ways um, over the next, you know, m- many many years ahead of us. Um, I do think that uh, the idea of a digital token is going to revolutionize uh, a lot of things about the ways we live. Um, to me, it's not just about a cryptocurrency, or it's not just about a token-based economy, it's really a new operating system for life. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, if you take a, take a look at his, take a look at all the things that are happening right now where people are investing, it's not just about DeFi. I think you're seeing a lot of innovation in uh, what I'll call um, social sphere, right? Or, or gaming or mm-hmm. things that we do every day, um, commerce, loyalty programs. And these are all huge businesses that any company can get into and companies will need things like digital tokens and cryptocurrency. The whole idea of Web3 is going to really transform how that's all done and make it much more decentralized, much better in terms of just being able to do things um, with a greater degree of control and just really amplify everything that we've seen you know, to um, uh, another level that I don't think, you know, this world has really experienced and but will experience very shortly. So I'm super excited about this, not in terms of just one thing, but it's really an operating system, a new way of just connecting life. And that's what excites me most about uh, Web3. For sure. Um, Let's talk about Coinbase. And I would love to get into the details of the listing process and how it all works on your end. Maybe you can take us behind the scenes a bit. Yeah. Um, look, our um, the way I describe our listings process is, you know, uh, the, way, the best way to understand it is to look at our mission and our values. Um, and our mission is really to increase economic freedom in the world. Um, and it's not just economic freedom; it's economic, it's social freedom, right? It's the ability to just do a lot of different things you couldn't do before. Um, and as a result of that mission. Um, One of the things that we have committed ourselves to doing is making sure that all the assets that all the tokens that you see across the crypto economy um, are, um, you know, that that we're looking at as many as we can and that we're listing every possible asset where it's legally um, where where we can or it's legally safe to do so. So uh, for us, it's about going out there and uh, making sure that uh, we can do everything we can to really pursue our mission of achieving economic freedom um, by giving people uh, as much choice in terms of which assets they should buy, which assets they should support, um, and really looking at whether or not, hey, is it legal for us to do so or not? We don't really take a subjective point of view in terms of um, this asset being better than the other, or we don't really pick winners or losers. We really go out there, apply our objective framework, and um, our, you know, our goal is to really list every possible asset where we can. And can you tell us, and, and this number is probably fluctuating as, as we're speaking, but uh, the total number of tokens or coins you guys have on the site or the exchange? Yeah, okay. Um, I think it's over 200. Um, it's listed on our uh, website. Um, and, um, you know, we've um, done that across, you know, obviously Ethereum and um, some of the core, um, more you know, the larger networks across the ecosystem, but we're doing a lot more, even on new networks, um, whether it's Solana or Polygon or Avalanche. You know, these are all networks that we're we're supporting. Um, so yeah, I, I think we have about a little bit north of two hundred. We can get you the exact number, mm-hmm. um, but um, and and we're adding more and more every week, right? So we're, uh, you know, there's a lot of projects that are coming out, and we're constantly monitoring, we're evaluating, we're assessing, we're applying our rigorous framework for risk. Um, and, um, you know, just doing all the, you know, where we apply the same model, no matter what the project is. And our goal is to make sure that we're capturing as many of those projects as possible, evaluating them such that we can, in fact, list every asset where it's legally, um, where, where we legally can. For sure. Um, I was wondering if you could tell us a bit about the red flags that you guys look at, and I know it's probably a long checklist and so forth, but maybe you can highlight 
I don't know, top five or so. And, and I think this will be helpful for users because there are a lot of new people to the crypto market. And um, we've seen there's, there have been scams right in the market and we have to watch out for that. So I'm curious, what are the red flags that you guys look at when a project comes to you? Yeah, so um, the, the words that I like to use when we talk about kind of how we look at assets is very similar to doing due diligence on a company. Um, you know, we do extensive amounts of research and due diligence on a project. And um, there are, are things that we look at that are much more structural, meaning, um, hey, does it pass our requirements for compliance and, uh, you know, money laundering or what we call AML um, guardrails, right? So we look at things like uh, who's behind the project team? Um, you know, what are people saying about the project? How has it been used? Mm -hmm. um, are there any uh, things that we need to be aware of as far as like regulatory infractions? So we're looking at compliance at, um, as one of the pillars we look at. Um, another pillar that we look at that's more structural is security, blockchain security. Mm -hmm. um, you know, is this a safe, smart contract? Are there things that are in the contract or the code that's going to be harmful to our users? Um, we have a massive library of what we call code signatures where we look at things that just are off or have been proven to be um, harmful in the past. So we do a lot of work reviewing smart contracts and um, doing a lot of just technical due diligence on whether or not the uh, code is safe. Um, and then we also look at, um, you know, um, um, uh, you know, our, our legal analysis to make sure that uh, we don't list securities because we don't. Um, and, um, you know, those three things are probably the things that we look at the most across every project we look at. Um, we also look at what we call business risks or kind of other risks that might not be captured in uh, those three pillars. Uh, so we'll look at, um, you know, social chatter, right? We'll look at what other projects were people involved with in the past. Have there been allegations of wrongdoing with people involved in the project, right? Um, and we'll look at utility, like what does this actually project actually do? Um, and, you know, we'll just, we, we'll, we'll evaluate everything and form an opinion on whether or not this is an asset we'd like to introduce to our um, to, to Coinbase users. So it is a very sophisticated process, sure. um, one that uh, you know involves a lot of different disciplines across the company. Um, you know, a lot of the information we find is available, but a lot of the information isn't really hard to, hard to, or easy to get to, right? So we have a lot of just digging and uh, interviewing and talking to people. We even meet teams, um, all to protect users from scams. Right, and to make sure that these are not projects that are just going to disappear, um, you know, in a day or two. So it's a very, very difficult and uh, challenging process, just because of the nature of of how quickly this industry moves. But one that we become very good at um, by virtue of just being very disciplined about how we do due diligence. Yeah, I'm sure it's very difficult, especially with all types of coins out there, different blockchains, and it sounds like you guys have a rigorous process for it. Um, on the security note, and I know this is a tough question to ask, and, and it's not just a Coinbase-specific uh, challenge, but every exchange out there, um, the security question, and I know you guys probably have security lawyers and so forth, but um, how, how are you navigating the waters given that the SEC hasn't officially you know, put out maybe an updated Howey test or they've only given Bitcoin, let's say, the green light? as a non-security. Um, and, and while your securities lawyers may, you know, they they have what the lingo, the language, the, the measuring stick, so to speak, they don't have the uh, updated version for crypto. We don't list securities. Um, and we made that very clear. Um, I think our, um, there's some, uh, there's a blog post that our chief legal officer wrote um, that does a really good job of saying it in very plain English. Um, and, you know, um, I'll tell you this, um, we have probably one of the most rigorous processes to analyze and determine whether or not uh, a digital asset um, can, can appear on our platform, on our exchange. Mm -hmm. um, we have a lot of uh, very experienced individuals who kind of understand how to navigate this. Um, and you know, to answer your question about whether or not there's a regular, regulatory framework anywhere, and it's not just the US, right? It's anywhere in the world. Um, you know, we 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 welcome working with regulators, and we want there to be clear frameworks. But in the absence of a clear framework, or in the presence of you know a framework that kind of changes from time to time, or a policy yeah. that's enforced via enforcement versus an actual framework, um, you know, we have to 
uh, you know, as a company, we have to kind of rely on some, some, some uh, rigorous framework. And that's the one that we've developed. So, you know, if there is frameworks or uh, regulations and guardrails that do get articulated by regulatory agencies, um, yeah, we'd love working with them. And obviously it's super important for us to be able to work with these agencies to make sure that we meet their um, requirements and standards. But in the absence of that, or as agencies are starting to formulate that, we have our, our process which we believe is extremely rigorous and is very, very good at making sure that we do not list securities. Got it. Got it. Um, let's talk about custody because in, in today's day and age of crypto, I, I, I've often talked about, we are in the web. I know we're talking about web three, but we're in crypto 1.0 and there's a lot of hacks and a lot of uh, exploits and so forth. And over time, those things will be fixed. The technology is going to get better and so forth. But what does Coinbase do to make sure the tokens, the assets are custody and protected? We, as a, um, I think the only publicly traded cryptocurrency exchange in the United States and a regulated one, um, we're also the, the most visible. Yeah. And, um, you know, we have to make sure that uh, we invest in the things that make us unique, special, and um and uh, you know matches up to the, our value proposition that we're promising to customers. Um, you know security and just making sure that we have the best in class security, um, whether it's um, uh, our hot wallets uh, that are self custodied, mm -hmm. whether it's kind of the semi custodial wallets we have with our um, our uh, retail accounts, mm -hmm. um, or even our um, cold storage that we do on behalf of uh, a lot of clients. Um, we probably have the best in class when it comes to security. And it's something that we take very seriously. Um, we don't ever sacrifice on things just for the purpose, just for speed, right? Um, you know, or the, the investments and just the brain power and just the thought and all the work that goes into making sure that we have the safest and most trusted platform. Um, I live and breathe that every day, you know, even getting onto this uh, this podcast via Zoom. We don't we can't use Zoom, right? So I had to like kind of figure out a way to use my personal laptop to make this work. Um, but it just speaks to how important and pervasive security is. Right. Customer protection and just taking care of our um, our Coinbase users. I and mean, that's we hear that the most in everything we do, right? So it's just part of our ethos and part of our DNA is safety and security is super important. And we have the best people um, you can possibly ask for in the industry. Yeah, I mean, you guys have partnered with some very big names who are using you for custody. So I think uh, that speaks to the great uh, technology and work that you guys have done. Um, and on that note, you know, you oversee a lot of partnerships at Coinbase. Um, what are some recent, you know, partnership announcements that you're excited about? Um, I, I, I know a lot of people definitely want to hear about BlackRock and how that came about as well. Look, um, a lot of our um, partnerships um, are focused on just making crypto and Web3 as mainstream as possible. Um, and one way to do that is to partner with companies that aren't necessarily leaders in Web3 or are native to crypto, but have done a fantastic job over the past 10 plus years establishing um, you know, tools and applications and things that the world needs just to kind of spin, right? Um, Google's a great example of that. We just announced a partnership with Google, Google Cloud, where we're allowing, um, or Google will be a, a allowed to bill their customers and customers will be able to pay their invoices with crypto. And there's a bunch of other things that we're doing with Google in terms of just nodes and, um, you know, providing them with the information that they need to kind of enhance their search across, you know, uh, across all these uh, blockchain protocols and networks. Um, so yeah, our, our partnerships are really focused on two areas. One is kind of the web two space, whether it's with the black rocks of the world and introducing their customers to crypto and being able to invest, buy, sell safely. Right. Um, and then the Googles of the world that are trying to do more, um, with, with web three or in web three, I need a partner to do so. We're also doing partnerships with web three or more crypto native companies. Right. Um, so, uh, two that we've done recently that I'm super excited about are all in the gaming space. Um, so there's a, 
you know, there's a Solana based game called EV.io where, you know, um, we did a deal with them where they're going to be building their stack um, on Coinbase Cloud. Um, we, you know, we also did a really cool deal with a, a very popular game in Asia called Titan Arena, where we did something a little bit more fun, uh, which is a, which is creating a custom loot box for uh, Coinbase customers who connect to the game and perform certain tasks within the game. They get a special NFT that allows them to enhance their gameplay with something they couldn't get elsewhere, right? So we love partnering with companies, um, both on, in Web 2 and Web 3. We think it helps accelerate growth. It also helps introduce our partners to the things that make us really cool and special and unique. Sure. Um, we also get exposed to a lot of entrepreneurs and innovators who are doing a lot of cool things that are cutting edge that we want to be a part of. So we're really uh, proud of our partnerships team. Um, and we're really proud of the fact that, you know, we, we're doing really cool deals with both Web 2 and Web 3 companies. And that's going to be the, one of the ways we... Uh, really help this industry grow. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, I mean, amazing job that you guys have done and you, you and the team have done with getting these partnerships, Google, as you mentioned, and uh, BlackRock. I mean, I don't know if you can take us without giving away, um, you know, too much. You know, what is it like talking to some of these traditional finance companies, and even tech companies like Google? And, you know, are, do they, are they at the point where they get it or you have to do a lot of educating uh, to, to convince them or to get them to understand what's happening. I was talking to a, um, a blockchain club at a, a pretty good university um, yesterday, and they said that membership um, in their club typically has an inverse relationship with the price of Bitcoin. So, uh, or I'm sorry, direct relationship, right? So the lower the price goes, the less, the fewer members they have and vice versa, except for this past year. Mm. They said for the first time in its history of this, of this blockchain club, um, even though prices have gone down, the number of uh, members have gone up. Uh, mm -hmm. We're seeing that in Web2 companies um, in terms of their level of interest in, in, uh, in crypto. Um, I think in the past, we've seen kind of the ebbs and flows of interest depending on whether or not, you know, people are talking about crypto and uh, largely, you know, whether or not crypto as an asset category is doing well or not. I will say that this time around, um, the just the sheer amount of interest and curiosity in the space has not been correlated with asset or digital token prices. Um, and we're seeing a lot of companies just very eager to do something. I have not met a Web2 company who doesn't have some form of Web3 operation or center of excellence or person on their team. Mm -hmm. um, and I have not met one that isn't planning to or already has invested heavily. Um, so Number one, great degree of interest in wanting to do something. Number two, um, these are large multi-billion dollar companies that are often publicly traded and they just can't pick and choose to work with anybody they want to. Sure. So they're looking for the most trusted partner, right? The ones that really respect regulation and have good relationships with governments. So they're naturally coming to Coinbase for that. Um, so that's been a really um, cool thing to kind of see, right? It's like, hey, we've done a lot of things to do this the right way. And now Web2 companies are finally seeing the value of that investment in trust and safety. Um, so number one, you know, again, or number two is all about wanting, you know, this interest in wanting to partner with credible, credible players in the industry. Um, and then number three, there's a significant desire to just learn um, and learn um, in two areas. One is like what's happening with the broader market. Um, how do you see the industry moving? Um, and then what can the partner do to kind of participate in that? So a lot of questions around, hey, how do we get into this space? Um, what's the best way for, uh, best place for us to enter Web3? Um, what kind of guidance can you give us so that we can be successful in this area? So, you know, I, I, there's a significant interest, you know, significant uh, desire to learn. Um, and a great degree of respect for just people who understand the value of trust and safety. And that's what I'm seeing a lot of. Uh, that's really great insight. And, you know, you mentioned uh, the fact that there's growing interest despite the price being down. It sounds like we've hit a tipping point um, where it's not about the price anymore. It's the technology and how can we adopt it and build with it? You said that's the word. It, it, it's a technology. Um, mm -hmm. And I don't think people quite understand that just yet, um, especially in areas outside of the U.S. where crypto really hasn't taken off as much as it has here. I was talking to a um, pretty large company um, a couple of days ago um, in a country in Asia, and um, we, you know, we're kind of going through the cycle of, hey, 
you know, what, what Coinbase is doing, what we think is going to happen in the future when Web3. Um, and then it kind of got to the Q&A session and it was pretty fascinating the types of questions they asked. Um, one of which was, is crypto going to be around in five years? Right? Like, wait a minute, I just talked to you about why it's great. Right. Um, or two, I don't get NFTs. Why would someone pay a million dollars for a JPEG? <laughs> um, and then number three, it's like, you know, like what exactly is, you know, the purpose of digital tokens um, beyond being able to like buy and sell stuff, right? So those questions, those types of questions show me uh, just how much more work we have as leaders in the industry right. to help people understand that it is a technology. Um, this is not about a JPEG, right? This is not about right. a uh, digital token that just kind of fluctuates in price every day. Um, this is really more about an operating system for life. And once you start to paint it that way um, and start to explain, you know, just like how many, many years ago, people were deciding, is it Apple or Microsoft, you know, who's going to win? We kind of have a version of that now um, across different networks. And once people kind of get that, then their curiosity starts to, you know, anchor itself to something a little lot more, you know, based on like, okay, how could this help me? Whereas before they kind of just read the sound bites and form an opinion because they don't understand. So education is so important and just helping people understand and frame this the right way. Is something that I'm really passionate about. For sure. And it just reminds me of something, uh, Kevin O'Leary of Shark Tank, Mr. Wonderful. Um, and I remember just earlier this year, he started framing the narrative as this is all software. And yes. I thought that was just a great way to frame it for people who may not understand it yet. And it's like, hey, these blockchains are just software. You can build on them and adopt them. I was telling somebody, and it was a controversial discussion, but it was kind of funny. I was like, you know what? Think of it this way. It's like, Ethereum's like Microsoft and Solana is like, you know, Mac OS or whatever. Um, and obviously that sparked a series of debates too for people who are passionate <laughs> about that. But like that kind of discussion, right, around understanding blockchains for what it can do versus like what it does today, today is so important to just leveling the playing field for understanding, especially with regulators and policymakers who are working on a bunch of other things. And it's just one of those many, many things. Yeah. Oh yeah. I mean, the point of regulators, cause I've spoken to some uh, members of Congress and, and so forth, you know, I can imagine, yes, look, I'm, I'm not an ageist or anything, but the older generation in Congress, it's, there's a, there's a bit of friction there, right. For them to gr grasp this. And it takes, it takes some time. And I know there's a lot of advocacy groups trying to bring that education factor, but yeah, you, you can't just go out there and talk about, uh, some of the crypto lingo or blockchain lingo, you got to bring it to what they know. And I think that transformation is happening. Um, uh, and, you know, for example, like my parents still don't know what I do exactly. They kind of know <laughs> the space that I'm in. Um, right. But, you know, as in the very beginning, I was trying to like explain this to them in a way that a Web3 or crypto native person might explain it to another person. Like, you know, let me explain to you how this particular network works. Let me explain to you you know, what tokenomics are all about, right? Um, and I started to like find myself kind of like, wait a minute, why am I doing this when they, they don't even understand kind of the very basics of what exactly we're working with here? Um, so I started to change my dialogue a lot when, when speaking with folks who are not in the industry on a day-to-day -day basis, mm -hmm. focusing more on, you know, think of this as more of a tech that we can use to make our lives better versus you know, a digital currency replaced in designed to replace like fiat. Um, you know, it's more than that, right? And that's what I try to talk about, which is one of the reasons why I love the word and prefer the word Web3 um, as opposed to crypto. Um, and people just tend to be a lot more open to having discussions when they hear the word Web3 and um, are less intimidated by that versus crypto. So right. it's all about how we explain and how we frame things up and just making it relevant for whoever you're talking to. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Um, tell us a bit about uh, your recent travels to Australia for Coinbase's Australia launch, and how did that go? Any takeaways that you can share? It was a fantastic launch. Um, it, uh, you know, I, th I think um, I met a lot of governments um, throughout the world, and I will say that you know the Australian government and kind of their um, points of view on crypto and Web three. Um, is a refreshing one. And um, 
uh, you know, it was a very, very um, cool opening in the sense that, you know, everyone that we invited from government were excited that we were there, um, had a lot of supporters from both Web 2 and Web 3. Um, unfortunately, it was like the rainiest week of like in Australia. In Australia? And, yeah, when, when we were there. Um, it was not supposed to be raining, right? But yeah, yeah. it's the massive rain. Um, it was just really, really refreshing to, um, you know, to do what we did there. Um, but more importantly, to really uh, start to engage Web3 communities and blockchain clubs all throughout Australia that's been waiting for kind of a global beacon like Coinbase to come in and start to activate, right? And start to get people interested again. And um, that's what we can do as a company that's respected around the world is to enter markets like Australia. Uh, partner with people who are very interested in proliferating the broader Web3 ecosystem and give people the confidence to do what they want, knowing that as a leader like Coinbase, you know, there to support them. So we were super excited about it. Um, we also got our license in Singapore um, that we recently announced. Um, and we're going to be doing more and more of this around the world, right? This is really about us partnering with governments and countries to make sure that we do Web3 the right way and to shed light on all the policies and procedures and all the frameworks that we built to become the most trusted platform um, in, in crypto. And um, we take that very, very seriously. Um, and uh, that's one of the reasons why our listings process is probably one of the most robust in the industry. For sure. Um, so you shared a lot about what you guys have been doing. Is there anything on your roadmap that you can allude to or hint to? I know there's probably things on the wrap and saved for announcements, but uh Anything, any breadcrumbs you can share with us for the remainder of 2022 and into 2023? I'll say this. Um, gaming is super interesting. <laughs> um, and I personally love it. My team loves it because it's one of those things that aren't going to be, nor do they have to be, entirely on chain. Mm -hmm. And game devs and players, those who build and those who, those who uh, partake, um, uh, you know, aren't like fundamentalists who want everything to be completely decentralized or on chain, right? Yeah. Um, the gamers are, they understand the value of user experience and perhaps users don't care which network a game is on. All they want to do is be able to play and have fun and earn and do all the cool things that you can't do in Web2 without, without crypto. So I think you're going to see a lot more from Coinbase in the area of gaming and um, in, in the social space. Um, you're also gonna see um, a lot more interesting things in our NFT marketplace. There's a couple of uh, drops that were that are coming up that I think will be um, very well received um, by people who love um, not just NFTs as a technology, but the whole entertainment and um, uh, social art form. So we'll see a lot there. Um, and the third thing that you'll see from us is a lot of focus on uh, education and um, education done the right way. One of the things that really started is starting to bother me is a very simple question, which is how do we know if a Web3 developer is good? Um, we know what they've done right. and we know what they can do, but how do we know if they know everything they need to know to create the safest Web3 experiences in the world. Um, the uh, analogy I give is like, imagine back 20 years when, you know, networking was a big thing, right? Physical networking. And there's a bunch of like Cisco switches you could buy. Um, and you can probably just buy them and figure out how to program them online and it'll probably work. But at some point, you're going to need to make sure that it's done the right way, especially as you scale, which is one of the reasons why you have these Cisco de you know, certified developer programs or engineers, right? Yeah, I think we're going to need that in Web3. And yeah. I think there's going to have to be some credibility um, uh, assigned to people around whether or not they can build safely. And once we, I think you're going to see a lot from us, from Coinbase, in advocating for um, learning how to develop Web3 the right way and to use tools that we believe are going to be the kind of tools that, you know, publicly traded Web2 companies need in order to really do Web3 safely. So that's probably going to be the third thing that you're going to see is a lot of focus on education and um, and certification. Oh, that's great. I love the education aspect because um, I feel 
like this technology is coming at us very fast and the world is changing as a result. And uh, there's a lot of the population that is not aware, they're not educated about it, and they don't realize jo- there's a lot of jobs here and, and could be even high school kids who can start learning how to code a blockchain or something, right? And including college, um, having yeah. curriculums for that. You know, look, it's it's whenever there's a... Um, so I remember the very beginning of Tesla when I was there, um, you know, we had launched Model 3 and, you know, the it, it wasn't a perfect execution, right? Um, you know, it's a brand new product um, with a lot of passion from both, you know, the company itself and, and those who um, are buying the cars. Um, and obviously over time, it gets better and better because you learn more, you produce more, you get more feedback. And, you know, that's the kind of industry that we're or space that we're in now, I believe, um, where there's a lot of innovation and, you know, anyone can get into start building Web3 just by virtue of just being passionate about it, right? You can go and like log on and watch videos and start doing things. But th- is it is the idea of like being able to build your own decks in five minutes like something that people should be proud of? Um, <laughs> or should it be more like, hey, um, let's like kind of take a step back and figure out like, okay, for the next generation of builders and developers, uh, what do we, what needs to happen in order for those developers to learn how to build the right way in the safe way. Um, getting really tired of all these hacks that we hear about and if you kind of like peel the, you know, open the hood a little bit. I think a lot of these could have been prevented with just better education and just better, you know, thinking about how these are designed. And that's one of the reasons why developer education, not just an introductory one, um, but one that actually kind of goes through the entire gamut of whether or not, hey, can you build for Web3 or not? And that's why I'm so passionate about that. And I think you're going to see a lot of that next year. I think a lot of what's needed in Web3 to get it to the next level and to proliferate it to the next billion users is going to require mainstream adoption and advocacy. And I think a lot of that's going to come from leaders like Coinbase, but also partners who've been in tech for a very long time mm-hmm. who need trusted players like Coinbase to help them get into the space and um, education and uh, just making sure that people are informed the right way um, are are super important uh, success factors for making that happen. Mm. Uh, I'm excited to see those updates and uh, would love to have you back on as as those things roll out. Um, I want uh, a few more questions here and then we'll wrap it up. Uh, What are your thoughts on crypto winter? You know, we're in a bear market, there are macroeconomic factors. Uh, when do you think we might see crypto spring? And uh, I know that's a hard question, but you know, uh-uh. <laughs> no, it's not. It's, it's a hard question because I think I don't think anyone knows right now, um, given how unique this particular winter is. And I don't even know if crypto winter is the right word to 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 describe what's going on, given all the macro, economic, and socio political issues that the world is facing. Sure. Um, if anything, I will say that the microeconomic environment that we're in um, probably provides more reason and rationale for why Web3 and crypto makes sense, Um, especially in the face of inflation. Brian Armstrong recently reminded us, you know, Bitcoin white paper was born after, you know, the 2008 um, financial crisis. Um, And, you know, we're going through a unprecedented unprecedented crisis now, right, coming out of a pandemic, and, um, you know, just what we you know, I don't think the world's kind of experienced that in modern day. Right. Yeah. So, um, you know, this whole idea of like a crypto winter, I think it's different this time just because there's a lot more things, many things going on. And, you know, the ex- explanation I gave you earlier around or the, the anecdote around the relationship between people interested in blockchain having, um, you know, having an inverse relationship with, with, with prices for the first time, um, I think that's just a signal to how crypto has become more of a technology and an operating system um, than just a an asset class that people invest in. Um, and uh, to me, I think to answer your question, when are we going to get out of this winter? I think it really depends on when the economy and the world is going to get out of get out of the rut that it's in. Um, I don't think it's going to be a separate event. I do think though that it'll validate and reinforce the importance of Web3 and crypto as a technology. For sure. And the importance of that in global stability. Yeah. yeah, I'm excited to see how governments adopt blockchain and, and some of these blockchains that exist out there in the, uh, in the open market 
and what that will look like. Um, but uh, I, I know we're coming up on time, so I want to give you, well, I want to ask you some wrap up questions here. First, rapid fire favorite food? Sushi. Hands down. <laughs> favorite musician or band? I don't have one. Um, I get <laughs> asked that question a lot. I will listen to whatever like I need to listen to in order to get through the day. Sure. <laughs> uh, favorite movie? Gosh, Top Gun Maverick. I, I've seen it <laughs> 10 times already. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I, I, I have not seen it. And I'm a fan of the original, but just a busy dad life, you know? Yep. Um, favorite book? Oh, man. Um, the Changing World of Order by Ray Dalio. I'm reading that now, actually. Um, um, it's a fascinating like perspective on the macro, macro, macroeconomic uh, view of things, right? Um, and then reading that in the view of like Web3 and crypto has been fascinating. So, yeah. Yeah, Ray, Ray's been on a roll lately, just sharing some amazing thoughts and uh, what's happening with civilization and technology and all that. It's, it's been great. Brian's, uh, Brian Armstrong, our founder, is a really big advocate of that book, too. That's why one of the reasons I got into it was, um, you know, I kind of like getting into the heads of, you know, innovators like Brian and kind of what, you know, what's inspired, what, what motivates them. And that's one of those books that he referenced that more than on, on more than one occasion. So. Mm. And when you're not working at Coinbase, what are you doing for a hobby? Man, I've, um, I've explored, you know, if you asked me this before the pandemic, I would have told you like, you know, riding my motorcycle and, um, you know, kind of, you know, you know going out there and just like playing sports with my friends. And now I got into gardening and, um, raising tomatoes and, um, like this whole farmer life that just kind of happened because I couldn't go anywhere. So as embarrassing as that sounds, that is my current hobby is, is gardening. <laughs> no, no, absolutely not. I, I actually, similar thing when I finally bought a house during the pandemic uh, to move out the city, I ended up doing a lot of gardening and yard work and things like that, which I never thought I would end up doing. <laughs> it's, there, it's, it's, it's such an interesting cause there's a, there's a part of it that it's, it's creation, right? There's part of it. That's like, um, keep me something alive. And then as part of it, it's like, if I can do this, then, you know, maybe like I can survive, you know, if there's another pandemic. <laughs> the zombie apocalypse too, right? Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, final item here. If you could create your own metaverse, what would the theme be? Oh man, it'd be just game, you know, having fun. Um, you know, I, I think, um, like we, we, like we're just always in a grind we're, we're working, we're having meetings, we're traveling. Um, I just don't have a lot of time and I have less and less so over, you know, as, as I get older to have fun. And that could be watching a movie, going to a concert or just shopping. And there's a way to do that without having to leave the home and still have an engaging experience. I think that would be really, really cool. For sure. Dan, a uh, pleasure chatting with you. I appreciate you taking the time and the information you share. Thank you so much. Pleasure to be on. And uh, hopefully we'll be on again in, in the future. Thank you.